Welcome to this eWater webcast. Good morning. My name is Geoffrey Adams from eWater and welcome. Today we're going to talk about introduction to water system planning and source. Future webcasts will cover more advanced topics and catchment modelling in source. With me I have Karina Redpath, Senior Hydrologist at eWater who will talk, talk the, do the second part of the webcast. And then Karina will move on to an introduction to source model building. Why do we use water system planning models? So I'm just quoting here from a senior Victorian official at a conference and she was up on the stage and she said, we don't do policy without modelling at first. So the point of modelling is that you can test the impact of various policies or policy options as well as looking at changes in water systems and climate change and catchment change and other things as well. So we establish a base model and then look at uh, scenarios off the base model to determine the impacts of policy or climate change or land use change etc. <coughs> so source has three major modes of operation. Up the top we have the planning type mode which is what this seminar webinar is based on. So this is for planning purposes or water system management. The second one there is catchment models. This is a uh, image showing, showing the uh, output of various rainfall runoff models on a catchment. So you can use catchment models in a planning mode if you like. If you don't have recorded inflow for example but wish to test planning options you can generate inflows from subcatchments and then run it through a planning model. You can also use catchment models for looking at the uh, impacts of climate change or land use change and various options for catchment management. And then the bottom view is an operations type view. So the operations view is based on a planning model, the top view, but it has the additional option of being able to have a two-dimensional uh, spreadsheet as you see there which represents both time and spatial distribution of the system. So that this is designed for real-time operation of river systems. So planning models, what are they used for? Typically they're used for assessing the reliability of supply of a water system, scenario analysis, as I said earlier that could be policy options or uh, upgrading options, climate change options, and they, the, the primary use in this day and age is preparation of water sharing plans. So we've all heard of the, well, the Australian people here anyway have heard of the Murray-Darling Basin and the Basin Plan, so that's, that's a case in point of water sharing plans. So catchment models, this is just a very brief introduction. So it's a semi-lump spatial representation of management and physical processes, so it has rainfall runoff models, we have constituent generation which could be salt or nutrients or other pollutants, we have some filtering so for example farm dams, we have the option of looking at the groundwater interactions and we can uh, transfer the output from a catchment model into a river network and system planning model. We can also have, uh, we can also integrate the planning functionality into the catchment model so we can have reservoirs and water management options within the actual rainfall runoff models as well. So this is an example of a operation model of the Goulburn system in Victoria, it's, it's actually a uh, sub, uh, it's, it's a part of the whole model. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. So that's just the schematic view of the planning model and then the next slide shows what the spread, this is off a different model, this is uh, off a Murray model, this one. The next uh, slide shows the spatial temporal view. So going across the top we have the, the spatial variation as you transfer down the rivers and down here we have time, one day at a time, stepping down. So you can actually see the flow of water in both historically and in your forward plan. So where are planning models used? So here we have an image of the Murray-Darling Basin and each one of those colours represents a water, uh, a water planning area and there could be a number of models in, in each water planning area or well, depending on the system you might have just one model. So for example if you look at uh, part of the Victorian system here, this covers a large number of rivers and there are at least two 
three water sharing plans, uh, water sharing planning models, which cover this area here. And one of these actually covers a large number of rivers. So this is actually a hypothetical uh, schematic of part of the Goldman system. There isn't actually a real model behind it, but this schematic that we see on the left was created in source, and it just shows the major components of what a source model would contain in, in terms of the physical attributes. So we've got inflows, we've got storage, we've got measurement locations, we've got regulating weirs. What isn't shown here is demands, but we, we would have demands. And over here on the right hand side, we have an image of what the uh, of how the actual schematic is represented on a map. So each of the nodes on the schematic has its geographic location embedded, and so when you uh, place it on a map, the nodes are shown in the correct location. So what's the process for creating planning models? So this slide here is from a website of the New South Wales Government, but it demonstrates the process fairly well. We have planning in the top left hand corner, and the planning is somewhat complex. We have models, we have community consultation, stakeholder consultation, there are generally a number of iterations in the planning process before the plan is locked down as a water sharing plan. We then have implementation of the plan, and the implementation might, would last for the duration of the plan, which might, for example, be, say, five or ten years. And then you have monitoring and evaluation of the plan for a number of purposes. Uh, one is to make sure the plan is properly implemented. Another is to make sure the plan is actually behaving as expected or intended, even if it is being implemented properly. So, for example, uh, this is an image of the Murrumbidgee River, again from the New South Wales website. There is in existence already a water sharing plan, and there will shortly be another water sharing plan, plan prepared. Uh, the next one will be prepared using source. And the existing water sharing plan is a legislative instrument. It is prepared under the Act of Parliament, the Water Management Act 2000. And so this has the uh, power of law behind it. And this is the front page of the Murrumbidgee water sharing plan. And in terms of the monitoring and evaluation, various governments, federal and state, have processes for reviewing the performance of these plans. So this is the front page of a uh, federal government level uh, monitoring report. This is uh, prepared by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and it's called the Water Audit Monitoring Report and it covers the basins within the Murray-Darling Basin. So each year the Murray-Darling Basin convenes a process for examining the compliance of the uh, different basins within the Murray-Darling Basin with the cap on diversions and the Murray-Darling Basin plan will uh, supersede this process. So, we're now up to the stage of introduction to source modelling, and I'll hand over to Karina Redbath. Hello, I'm Karina Redpath, a senior hydrologist at eWater, and I'm going to take you through the next section, which will be an introduction to source model building. I'll start with um, some general concepts and move into some more specifics on particular nodes and what they do to help control the water. Source models include physical aspects and management aspects. The physical aspects tell you how much water you have. On the left we see we've got uh, the bucket here which tells you uh, the rainfall and evaporation, stream flow, quantities of water. On the right here we show the, the rules basically that cover the water, so resource assessment and storage operation, flow sharing, etc. These two concepts are combined together in the source model to, to help plan our systems and manage. First we start off by creating a river network, so we have what is called a node palette which we use in source to drag and drop our nodes onto the schematic and we build those, connect them together with links. The networks can be connected with confluence combining two streams of flow to one and splitters which divide one into two they can split out and come back again in anabranches 
And we also have two types of water ordering representation. First of all, we need to create the demands using water users and minimum flow and environmental demands. So these demands will be supplied by the storages. Types of demand are time series demand. There, there are a number of demand models within a water user. So time series demand is one, a fixed demand pattern. Irrigation, there's a, a couple of different irrigation demand models. Minimum flows in a separate a separate node, an environmental demand model is also in a separate node. Each of these individual nodes I can explain to you a bit better with, with an understanding of the computation phases. We have, first of all, the first phase that we have is a constraints phase where we calculate the limit on the orders that can be placed and that is calculated from upstream to downstream. And the next phase is the order phase which is calculated from downstream to upstream. So for instance a constraint may be the constraint of a storage outlet or a constraint added by the maximum order constraint node. Whereas the order phase, the orders will be placed by nodes such as a water user and that will travel upstream and environmental demand node will create a con uh, an order also and those orders will be combined and passed again upstream. A minimum flow may add some orders on top of that and those orders will then be received by the storage. Finally is the flow phase which is calculated from upstream to downstream, which tells you how much water you have in your system. So you'll start, of course, with the inflow at the top and how much water is in your storage, and it will make releases downstream to meet the orders and limited by the constraints. Here are some nodes in source that control flow as opposed to actually using flow. So the water users, for instance, will use flow, will take flow out of the system, whereas these nodes will control the amount of flow which can be released. So we have minimum flow, environmental demand, we have maximum order constraint, constro controlled splitter, and storage outlets also control the amount of flow which is released. I'll talk about these individually, starting with minimum flow requirement. Now minimum flow requirement will be used to represent storage releases and in-stream requirements. What it will do is it will receive a number of orders from upstream, from sorry, from downstream that have been generated by the demands downstream of it. And if those orders are not um, equal to or exceeding the minimum flow requirement, it will add orders to that so that it meets at least the minimum flow. Now minimum flow can be exceeded, of course, so minimum just represents the minimum amount that we want at that point, but it can also be not met on occasions when constraints such as storage outlets will limit the amount of water that can, can reach your minimum flow requirement. Secondly, we have an environmental demand node, which is like a sophisticated minimum flow node that is, is uh, designed to 
capture the most commonly defined environmental flow requirements that we have in Australia. It generates demands. It doesn't actually use the water, but it generates demands which will meet environmental requirements. This was formerly called the environmental demand model, which was part of, in earlier versions, part of the water user node, but is now its own individual node and much more sophisticated. The uh, environmental demand node can be inclusive or exclusive of downstream orders. So what it does is it adds orders to the, the orders that it receives. So it can either add orders to, um, to a limit, like a minimum flow, or if it's exclusive, like a water user, it can be like a water user but not actually using the water. And this is uh, used for shepherding the flow. Also, an environmental demand node can link to accounts, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail later. An environmental demand node has a number of aspects. Firstly, we have a reference, which is like a uh, natural flow that we compare the uh, requirements to. It can be entered as a value, a time series data source or a function. Similarly, a condition can be add, added as a value time series data source or function, but it is, um, it's a trigger that we use to activate or deactivate the flow rules. I understand we have a question. Um, I think I might hand you over to Jeff for the question and the answer just for a moment. Okay, I've got a better set of glasses on than Karina, so I'll read the question out. For a water user, can the model consider different license types, such as basic water right, water access right? How does it consider amount of extracted water licensed or something? So the, the answer to the first part is yes, you can have a number of different water, water licenses attached to any, any different water user. So you can even handle trade of uh, water licenses from a different water user or even a different jurisdiction. So any individual water user can have a high security license, a general security license, a low security license, stock and domestic license, and they can all be attached to the same water user. In answer to the second question, how does it consider extracted water, that's touching on what Corinne will get to later in the presentation when she talks about water accounting and water resource assessment. So if that's okay, I'll leave, leave the answer to that question till later. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, back to environmental demand node. We were talking about the conditions that uh, can activate and deactivate flow rules. Uh, there's a screen capture just below condition which shows uh, where you define a flow rule, where you make reference to the condition. So you can have uh, it, the condition can be uh, either e exceeded or um, above or below to activate or deactivate the flow rule. There's four basic types of flow rules. There's flood fresh rule which represents uh, simulating um, some, uh, well creating some floods that um, is required by some species for survival. There's flow pattern rules and minimum flow rules. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about these at this stage. We'll probably go into more detail in our our course, our upcoming course, which we'll probably talk about later, I think. And uh, translucency rule, which is basically makes reference to a time series, which is quite often the inflow to a storage and creates demands, which is some reflection of that inflow. All of these flow rules can be managed with priorities and dependencies. The priority of the flow rule works from the top down. So the, the, the first rule on the top will be higher priority, moving down to lower priority. The dependencies can be set via, um, via a separate 
section, which is shown screen capture there. So that would mean that the first flow rule doesn't activate until the second rule is satisfied. Now we have maximum order constraint, which is something that adds a constraint to the orders. So this node will receive orders and if the orders exceed the amount it specifies, it will cap it to that amount. It can be used to represent channel capacity and it will restrict orders. It doesn't necessarily mean that the flow will be restricted to that amount because you may be receiving a flood, a flood wave coming through but it will restrict the amount that is ordered and released from the storage. Here we come into where we divide our flow in a network. We have a controlled splitter which bifurcates the flow. It goes from one branch to two. It can be used to represent distributed distributaries, effluent and anabranch. It can also be used to represent losses, although control splitters will require two downstream links. Uh, in the case of losses, you would just make one of those links not connected to the rest of the network. You can also, you can define which branch is your effluent, so you can choose which one. It will show it on, on the on the GUI, on the display, which one is the effluent is represented with the cross through the the arrow. So these have a minimum and maximum effluent. You can either set those as the same or you can use something which is a regulated opening percentage. If it's 0%, which is the default, it will uh, release at the minimum unless it needs extra for orders. If you have it set at 100%, then your minimum equals your maximum. So that will be that will represent the regulator being 100% open. Now we go on to the the storage node. I'm not going to talk a lot about the actual storage, but we're talking about how to control the releases from the storage. So in this case, we're talking about flood operation. We have a gated spillway, which also has a minimum and maximum discharge relationship. And you can use the minimum, you can use the, the, the gates can be closed to limit the amount that is spilled over the gated spillway and that will uh, decrease the, the uh, discharge closer to the minimum. The gated spillway, we're actually going to add more flood operation functionality very soon, which is a bit like the, for those of you who are familiar with IQQM, a bit like the IQQM uh, gated spillway flood operation. We can also operate for floods using a rule curve. A rule curve is like a minimum flow requirement monthly pattern which is dependent on a trigger. Usually we specify the trigger as a storage volume. So a trigger storage volume, it doesn't have to be the supply storage, but it can be any storage that um, you feel should control the flow. You can see in the, this, this is actually applied at a minimum flow node. So this is one of the many options for minimum flow and it will usually be placed below a storage. <coughs> I think there's a question. This is, I think Jeff would like to answer this question. Here he is. Thanks, Karina. I'll just read the question out for those who didn't ask it. I'm sure you will get to it, and uh, we weren't going to get to this, so <laughs> that's why I'm answering it now. But is there a loss node that can represent wetlands along a system or would you use lots of storage nodes? So there isn't a specific wetland loss node, but we do have a loss node. So if you have a simple uh, relationship to represent the loss, then you can apply that a loss node or you can apply the same relationship to a link, which represents a river reach. But we also have specific wetland functionality, which allows a hydraulic connection between the river and the storage 
a wetland rather, or between the wetland and the storage. So if you wish to model the wetland uh, that way and the losses, you can do it through a wetland, no, uh, through a storage representing a wetland. The wetland also allows uh, groundwater interaction as well. I'll just hand back to Karina now. Hi, I'm back again. Thank you, Jeff, for answering those questions. It's still very hard for me to see the screen sometimes. Okay, we're moving on from, from flood operations. This is what our source model will look like. Um, this is, I think, a slide that Jeff showed you earlier, it's just showing storages and you know the nodes and links, etc. Now we move on to more of the management side of things, resource assessment. I'm not sure how much time have we got left, Jeff. We've got plenty. Okay, resource assessment. Now, in resource assessment, it's a way of assessing the water and sharing it amongst our users. What it does is it balances uh, the assess water resource volume against what the users are requiring, their accounts, and, and limiting and controlling that. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a number of water accounting methods. There's annual accounting, <coughs> excuse me, which considers considers the water user's account on an annual basis, so it will reset ev annually. So if you consider a water user, they might have a license for a certain amount of water. That's that's their account. So the their account will be reset at, the, at a specified date annually for annual accounting. And with annual accounting, you'll have carryover from, or you can have carryover from one year to another year. Continuous accounting, on the other hand, is like more like a, more like a bank balance. It's a continuous um, accounting of the system. It's not reset annually. It's um, more ongoing day-by-day -day account and continuous sharing is very similar to and continuous counting, accounting but it takes into account operational losses in a different way. We also have off allocation, flow sharing which is a more sophisticated concept we'll probably talk about in more detail in our course, our upcoming course. And with each of these, we, we can also have allocation. So an allocation is like the portion of the account which a user is allowed to use uh, at a certain time when an allocation is announced. Okay, I've, I've pretty much talked over, talked to these already, what, discuss what the annual accounting is and continuous accounting and continuous sharing. Um, we might just move on to the next slide. Okay, an overall concept of what resource assessment is, it's how much water there is available and and then sharing that amongst the users. We can have ownership of that resource, so who governs the water in the system, and then individual accounts are who gets the water. So um, each, of, each user will have a license, for instance. Within that, we have priorities and share and carry over how much you can use for the next time, as in, in the next year in annual accounting. So this is how we assess our resource. We have an existing amount of water and storage which we can, to which we can add our expected inflows and we will remove the losses which is say evaporation and operation losses. So a, an analogy here which is um, 
how big is the cake? That's how how much of it have we got, and who gets a slice? So that's the uh, water users and who gets to eat first. So that's our priorities. This is an example of carryover, which is um, this is a a, uh, a snapshot of New South Wales system. And in this particular case, their carryover is limited to um, 0.3 megalitres per unit share. Now, a unit share is like the um, the account amount. Um, and I think at this point I pass you back to Jeff for the final few slides. So that concludes the presentation. The final slide just advertises the upcoming introductory training course which is to be held in Melbourne 21-22 September. So that's a two-day introductory course. There will be later more advanced courses coming which have been advertised and will be advertised again. Are there any further questions? So the question is, what is the easiest way to do a storage and inflow share on a storage node? So I assume we're talking capacity sharing or something like that here. So there are a couple of ways of doing that, or a few ways. Probably the one way would be to do resource assessment, which was the last thing Karina spoke of. You can implement an ownership system where you specify that a certain proportion of the inflow and a certain share of the storage belongs to each owner. So the owners could be different bulk entitlement holders, for example, or they could be different states, different jurisdictions. Uh, a different way that's been done is to create what's called a plug-in, which is a small function to track the ownership of the water as well. That's probably the most efficient and effective way of doing it, but, and that has been done in some models. So there are a number of ways of doing it. We haven't actually touched on ways of expanding source, such as using functions or plugins. There is actually a special course on plugins. Functions are similar to Excel type functionality and they add a lot of power to most of the functionality within source, whether it be minimum flows or maximum flows. So I hope I've answered that question adequately. We have two pumped off-stream storages. Can I add trunk main capacities? Um, Essentially, you can. you can. You can express the capacity of an outlet from a storage, use, uh, just using the table within the outlet, within the outlet uh, setup, and you use that to set the capacity. Any more questions? So far, there have been very pertinent, relevant questions, so don't feel shy. Can source be used for urban water planning? Yes, it can. In, uh, very simply, in fact, uh, if you go back into the history of where source came from, the original models that source was perhaps derived from was, uh, were initially urban water models which were later expanded to do rural, rural water system modelling. Further questions? Okay, I'll, we'll stay online for another two or three minutes just in case somebody asks further questions. Can we use source to model groundwater losses and gains from rivers? Yes, we can. Uh, we've got two different systems for doing that and that's the analytic, analytical system and the numerical, numerical model. Thank you, Karina. <laughs> so uh, one of those is new and the other one has been there for quite some time but they do enable modelling of uh, flow to and from the river uh, from the groundwater system. And again, is it feasible to use a planning model as a hydrology input for a catchment pollutant load model? The Models, we, we can link within source, we can link both a catchment model and a planning model. The, the two different models can be linked, so the answer is yes, uh, although we'd normally use it the other way around. 
as in link, using a catchment model to, uh, to output to the planning model. So the question is, which node types would be used for groundwater loss gain? In actual fact, that's done on a link. So if you open up a routing link, so first of all, you have to change the link from its default straight through link to become a routing link. And then once it's a routing link, you can edit the link and make it do the groundwater surface water interaction. There are a lot of options in groundwater surface water interaction, so you would probably need some assistance to set that up. I believe it's, in, it's documented in the SRG though. Is continuous accounting the same as continuous water balancing? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by continuous water balancing. Uh, continuous accounting is a way of maintaining on a continual basis the a user's right to water which has been allocated to the user. So if the user doesn't use the water in one year or in one season, they don't lose it, apart from through evaporation, they, they maintain continual access to water which has been allocated to them and which they haven't used. And the next question, is it a daily time step model? You get to choose the time step, often it is used in daily mode, but you can say choose monthly or sub-daily, that's, that's up to the user to choose, it depends on the purpose that the model is being used for. Okay. The questions have slowed down, so I'll stay on the line for one more minute, just in case. Okay. Thank you everybody. In answer to the question, yes, it can accommodate over 100 years of daily data. We have some models, eWater doesn't, there are models out there which typically in the Murray-Darling Basin, for example, run to 117 years, I think it is. Not all of the functionality discussed today is in the public version. The water accounting is not in the public version. Okay. Thank you, everybody.